Right, uh, good morning, good afternoon everybody, wherever in the world you are. Welcome to the uh, webinar we're doing today on IFRS 13, Fair Value Measurement. Uh, to introduce myself, my name is Bruce McKenzie from W Consulting and uh, coming to you from uh, Johannesburg at the moment in South Africa. And we're going to spend today taking a look at the new standard that the ISB has issued to deal with fair value. Now, before we get started, I just wanted to give you an update in terms of where we were in, uh, in, in terms of uh, developments in IFRS and the latest work plan from the International Accounting Standards Board. Uh, you'll see on the slide that, uh, that should be loading for you guys now is the latest work plan that the, uh, the International Accounting Standards Board has put out, uh, and this one was dated 1st of February. And you can see that the, uh, the timelines for the major projects that they're working on have started moving out further. Uh, you can see the big four, which are the ones they're talking about at the moment, being IFRS 9 on financial instruments, leases, revenue recognition, and on the next slide you would have seen insurance. Uh, these are projects that they'd intended to finish very shortly, but they haven't got there, um, and some major, major delays. Just to spend a minute or two taking you through those, uh, you can start off with the IFRS 9 project and see that the, the real challenges they're having there, especially in the area of impairment where the ISB is, uh, the, the, the exposure draft that they issued on impairment has not been working. Uh, they are going to plan to re-expose that with a, new, uh, with, a, with, a, with a new exposure draft there. Uh, in addition, you'll see that the hedge accounting, they are talking about hopefully finishing that in the second half of this year, so at least we'll get some feeling uh, as to where that is. As far as leases and revenue recognition go, um, revenue recognition, we have already had the second exposure draft, which is out, um, and uh, we, you would be able to have a look at that and see the uh, changes that they're proposing there. Some quite fundamental changes, and we are going to plan a webinar on that uh, uh, later. And the second one is leases. We're still waiting for a new exposure draft on leases. Now, for those of you who don't remember, this is the leasing project where they're saying that we're going to have all leases being capitalized, effectively everything being a finance lease. Uh, the initial exposure draft obviously has had quite a lot of comment, quite a few concerns, so I think you are going to see uh, quite a bit in terms of uh, some changes there. But uh, we'll have to wait and see what, uh, what takes place there. Um, in addition to that, on the next slide, you will be able to see insurance. They are looking at a new standard on insurance, which should be coming out uh, a revised uh, exposure draft later this year. Remember, that is not for insurance companies, uh, not for insurance brokers or companies holding insurance. It's for the insurance company itself. And then the last thing just to mention on that slide is we are going to see the new improvements project coming out shortly. Um, that's the annual improvements 2009 to 2011. That will be just a number of changes that they'll be putting through improvements to standards and we'll take a look at those when they come out. So as you can see, quite a lot that's uh, starting to happen at the moment. Quite a number of developments still, large developments, think of it, revenue recognition, leases, financial instruments. Most of that will probably impact uh, most companies that, that, that you deal with, so quite a few changes coming out there. Right, let's get on to today's topic, and we're going to spend time looking at the new standard IFRS 13 on fair value measurement. Now, this is an interesting standard that I think has been quite long coming. Um, they've needed to address fair value for quite a long time. If you think about it, there's a lot of reference to fair value throughout the IFRS literature, and the key thing to point out there is that wherever they've had fair value, there hasn't really been a sound principle in terms of how we calculate fair value. So what they're wanting to do is they've come out with a single cohesive framework to take a look at how we determine fair value, and obviously this will create some sort of consistency across the various standards. The idea also being that where we refer to IFRS in agriculture, sorry, fair value in agriculture, or if we refer to fair value in property, plant, and equipment, or an in investment property, wherever it may be, that we have the same basis for calculating fair value. Now, I want you to do a quick exercise for me. I, where are you sitting at the moment? I want you just to take a, a minute, so I'm literally going to give you a minute, just to work through and decide which stands do you think require fair value? Um, I want you just to grab a pen and paper, I'm going to give you one minute literally, and I want you just to write down, if you can't remember the name of the standard, the number, just write down which standards you believe uh, require fair value. Have a quick look at that, I'll give you a minute, and then I'll come back. <laughs> 
take a look at that. So the question I asked you is, which standards do you think include fair value? Now, if you take a look at the uh, the IFRS literature, uh, fair value, some of you may have three, four, some of you may have uh, ten standards even. But if you think about it, fair value almost permeates throughout the entire uh, standards on, uh, on IFRS. I mean, if we take a look at the list here, you'll see the list of standards I've just put down. I mean, there's IFRS 1 on, uh, on, on first-time adoption, IFRS 2 on share-based payments, IFRS 3 on business combinations, there's insurance, non-current assets held for sale, financial instruments, leases, uh, property plant and equipment, agriculture, investment properties, financial instruments under IFRS 9, financial instruments under IS 39. I mean, if we go through it, it's almost, I wouldn't say all, but pretty close to it. A lot of the standards in IFRS are still requiring us to take a look at fair value. And this creates a concern because, as I said, there wasn't really a single concept of fair value. And what the ISB has now said is all over the standards, wherever it refers to fair value, we're going to come back to this. So if we take a look at the scoping then, what exactly does IFRS 13 apply to? It applies where one of the other standards requires or permits you to use fair value. What's very important to point out is that you're not required, this the standard does not require you to use fair value in any place. It says where in other standards where you refer to fair value, that is when we want you to refer to IFRS 13. It does, however, set some new disclosure requirements, and I'll touch on those at the end. Now, just to point out some of the things that have been excluded, uh, the first standard that has been excluded from IFRS 13 is uh, IFRS 2 on share-based payments. The reason for that is that many of you would have worked with share-based payments and will know that the share-based payment standard has its own requirements for fair value. And it brings in things like the vesting conditions, the non-vesting conditions, uh, whether something's a market, a non-performance, all these type of various things that come in. So because IFRS 2 has its own fair value uh, requirements, it, it's scoped out. The second one is on leasing. And the reason I-17 on leasing is being excluded from this is that we don't want people to go through major change right now. Remember, there is a major project on the go to readdress leasing, and I think the view of the ISB was before making it overly complex for you, uh, we're going to scope leasing out for now. Once the new leasing project has been completed, then the ISB can come back and take a look and see whether this should be applied. The other thing they wanted to do is just point out that not everything is fair value, and the two we've illustrated there are IS2 and IS36. Remember, for IS2 on inventory, you're required to account for inventory at the lower of cost or net realizable value. Note that net realizable value in that sense is not fair value, as there are various factors under IS2 you would take into account. So the key thing to point out is we would not uh, apply this to IS2. The other standard it wouldn't apply to is when you're looking at value in use under IS36 on impairment. Remember, IS36 on impairment is when you're looking at an asset for impairment, you look at the higher of the fair value less cost to sell or value and use. Note there that value and use in that sense is not fair value. So we're not going to require you to, to do a fair value calculation there. The other thing to point out is it has excluded from its disclosure requirements uh, the requirements of IS19 and 26 relating to pensions uh, and, of course, assets at fair value less cost to sell in terms of IS36. So a couple of disclosure exclusions at the bottom of that slide. Now, let's get into the, 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 the meat of the standard. The first thing to point out is the standard says to you, you need to look at the new definition of fair value. And they've defined fair value as follows. The price that would be received to sell an asset or paid to transfer a liability in an orderly transaction between market participants at the measurement date. Now, if we stop there, let's just break that down. The first thing it says is the price it would be either to receive an asset or paid to transfer a liability. So the starting point there is remember that this fair value applies both to assets and to liabilities. It then says in an orderly transaction between market participants at the measurement date. And we'll look at each of those key components now. In essence, what we've summarized at the bottom as is we're talking about the exit price. What would it cost you to exit a liability on your balance sheet? Or what would you receive to exit owning an asset? And that's what we're going to take a look at. Now, in breaking down this definition, the standard in essence says there are three components that one would need to look at in determining fair value. Those are firstly, what is the transaction? Secondly, what is the market in which the transaction takes place? And thirdly, who would my market participants be? Now, in order to calculate fair value, you do need to have all three of these components. So I'd want you to be able to determine all of those in order to then determine how we calculate fair value. 
Now the way we do that is the standard says that in order to work out how we determine fair value, it requires you to create hypothetical scenarios around situations where you would sell that asset or obviously transfer that liability. Now this is an interesting concept because the use of hypothetical scenarios is not very common to many of you. Um, to explain what a hypothetical scenario would be, it's a situation where we would say we're going to create a scenario in which we were, for want of a better word, pretending we were selling the asset. So it's not what is happening in fact, it's what would happen should we be selling the asset. And that's the hypothetical scenario they're looking at. As to why they're using a hypothetical scenario, we'll take a look at later. Now in determining the hypothetical scenario, the standard says there are three key elements you need to determine. And those are the three listed at the bottom of the, uh, of the slide there. Firstly, being orderly transactions. Secondly, being the market participants. And thirdly, being the market, and where the transaction takes place. Let's take a look at each of those in detail. The first one you would need to look at is the orderly transaction. Now remember, that I wanted to point out that this starts getting a bit complex, but, but please remember, uh, folks, that this is applicable to all of us. We're talking here about property, plant, and equipment. We're talking about investment property. You're talking about agriculture, so this isn't just financial instruments. Now the first one you're taking a look at is the orderly transaction. And it says you need to, in the hypothetical scenario, determine what is the transaction. And in an orderly transaction, it assumes that you're transacting in a way that whatever you are selling has been exposed to the market for a reasonable amount of time. So whatever you would be looking to sell, you would assume has been in the market for whatever time generally in that market would be required. So for example, if you were selling a computer, you may say, look, if we're selling a computer, it only needs to be advertised for two weeks and then we consider the advertising done. Whereas, for example, if you're selling a commercial building, it may require three, four, five months. So you would need to say the assumption is it's been in the market. The other thing in the assumptions you assume is that this is not a forced transaction. So we're not, we don't have to sell it, we want to sell it. An example we've given there is something called a fire sale. Uh, a fire sale, for those of you who don't know what that is, is a situation where you have to sell something. So for example, if my business was insolvent, I desperately need money just to pay salaries, I would start selling whatever assets I had for whatever cost I had just to get money in. In that situation, that's a fire sale. We assume in our hypothetical scenario that this is not a fire sale. Okay, so the first thing you determine is the orderly transaction. The second thing we, deter we have to determine is you have to determine what is the market in which this transaction takes place. So we're saying, where are we determining the market? We say, what is the principal market for that asset and liability? Now, in determining the principal market, the standard says the principal market is the market in which you normally transact. Okay, so what market do you normally sell these assets in? Or what market do you normally transfer liabilities in? I'll speak mostly about assets in this scenario because for you, most of you to be an asset. So where would you principally sell those? Now most of the time I think that the answer to that's going to be relatively easy. I think that you'll be able to determine your principal market by just looking at the type of business you're dealing with. But what if you couldn't? So assume I was in a situation where I was a, uh, a sheep farmer and I was uh, farming in an area which was very remote. Assume that I could uh, transfer my sheep or, or, or put my sheep in a track and transport them to three or four different markets. And I'm not sure which one I would consider my principal market because I deal with all of them. Then the standard says the assumption would be you look at that market with the most advantageous market you have access to. In other words, which market could you access and is most advantageous? So which market do you sell the sheep for the most in? And I, obviously with those transaction and transport costs could arise. And the standard says you do take those into account when you are determining whether or not you, you know, what the fair value is. So in this situation we're saying determine the market. Whatever your principal market is, the market you normally transact in, if you cannot determine the, that principal market from normal evidence, then it says look at the most advantageous market you have access to. The third element you have to take a look at, so we've determined obviously what the transaction is and we've determined the market. The third element they're wanting you to determine is who are the market participants. In other words, who are the hypothetical counterparties with which we would trade in this market?
Now, very importantly here, there's a number of factors you have to take into account when you are determining who these people are. Because I'm wanting to be in a situation where you can say, I know who I'm transacting with in that market. To start off with, the standard says you'd need to take to assume that these people were going to be independent. So what we mean by that is that they are independent parties, and in defining what independent is, we would define independent as in relation to IS24. So who are the people independent? In other words, they can't be related parties. Now that can be a challenge, because let's take a scenario. Let's assume that I am the subsidiary of company A, and you are also a subsidiary of company A. If I am transferring all my output, or I'm selling something to you, or whatever the transaction is between us, is required to be at fair value, I would have to say, well, as you are not independent, I would have to say, what would I sell this asset for in a market in which an independent person purchased it from me? So in my hypothetical scenario, I would have to assume that you are looking at an independent party and not, uh, the, the, not, not, not the party with which I'm potentially dealing with. So you do need to assume that they're independent. Secondly, you have to assume that these people are knowledgeable. Now what we mean by that is you have to assume that they have a reasonable understanding of the asset or liability. So if in normal markets they would have done a due diligence, you would therefore have to say, my assumption is that they've done the due diligence. Now that can always be a bit tricky, because let me give you an example. Let's, let's assume you had a, a building, an office building, and your assumption was it was worth $5 million. Assuming I said, well, if I take that, that, that $5 million asset, let's assume that, uh, that I'm going to sell it. And I said, well, generally I go out and I get a valuation and see what I think it's worth. And that may be based on things like discounted cash flows. But I assume then and say, well, if somebody did a due diligence, they would realize that maybe there's a pipe leaking on the 10th floor and maybe there's a bit of an issue with the wall on the 7th floor. And, and I would know all the problems that came into effect. And by taking those into account, it may actually lower the fair value of my asset. So it's very important to point out you have to assume that they're knowledgeable and have all the information that you would have had had you done that fair value. Third thing you have to assume is that you have to assume these people are able to transact. So for example, you would assume that the counterparty has the finance to do it. Secondly, you would assume that they legally were allowed to do it. So for example, if you needed approval from, say, a competitions commission or somebody to that degree, we would say it's irrelevant, you still assume that they have, have got all the approvals that they need in order to carry out the, uh, the transaction. And lastly, you'd assume that these people are willing to transact. So once again, it's not a forced transaction. They're willing to transact because clearly you have an asset that they want. So key thing here, your market, counter, your market participants, you have to assume are independent, knowledgeable, able to transact, and of course, willing to transact. Now, if we take a look at what we're saying, in essence, what I'm saying to you is that there are really the three things. And I'm just coming back to the slide that says, where are you working out your fair value? The starting point is you need to determine, in that hypothetical scenario, what is the transaction, what is the market in which we're dealing, and who are the market participants. Now, the question that generally arises whenever we deal with people is, why would they require us to use hypotheticals? Isn't this just making things a lot more difficult? The standard setters have taken the view that they believe that obviously by doing a hypothetical scenario, it's more likely that you're going to use a lot more inputs that are observable. Now what I mean by that is generally when you're doing work to this degree, and, and let's be honest, this standard's going to result in a lot more work for you, you're generally going to use a lot more uh, uh, market-based things. So for example, I'm going to say, well, what is my most advantageous market? And I'd actually go out and try and find evidence thereof. I'd say, who are the counterparties? Are they independent? Well, no, they're not. We're actually giving it to a related party that's at fair value less 10%, so we may need to adjust for that. And I think as you work through the creation of the hypothetical scenario, I do think you're going to find that you'll probably do a bit more work and that your answer will be a lot more robust. So I think very importantly, I think this will give us much better fair values, but I think there's a bit more work for you guys to do on those. Now, all that said, there's a couple of uh, considerations that they do say you need to take into account, and, and these create a bit of a challenge for you. The first of those is that they say when you, you, you're applying these principles, you apply them to all assets and liabilities that you're measuring at fair value. But then they've just got two things that they give additional consideration to. And those are the first one on, in the blue box that talks about non-financial assets, and the second one is liabilities. Now, let's start by taking a look at the non-financial assets. <clears throat> 
Now, non-financial assets, remember what we're talking about there is I'm talking about your, 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 your kind of property plant and equipment or your investment property. So this is not your financial things, your derivatives, etc., etc. These are your machines, your cars, your airplanes, your buildings, your factories, all those things that generally impact a lot of our clients. And the key thing to point out here is to say where you have this type of situation and you're valuing non-financial assets, the standard says you have to take into account a concept they call highest and best use. Now what this means is it implies that you would always use an asset to its highest or best use, irrespective of how you're currently using it. Now this is a bit of an interesting concept and, and let me give you an example to try and help it explain. Assume I had a machine that made uh, chocolates, little small chocolates. Assume the machine that I purchased could produce 5,000 chocolates a day. But I'm only currently producing 2,000 chocolates a day because I only need 2,000 chocolates. Uh, not that the market couldn't buy 5,000, but assume that at the moment, my client base, I've only managed to secure sales of 2,000 chocolates. When it came to fair valuing the asset, the standard says I have to use this principle of highest and best use. And what that means is that I would have to say, well, when I'm fair valuing the asset, regardless of whether I'm only doing 2,000 at the moment, I would have to value this machine as if it was producing 5,000 chocolates a day. Now that's an interesting concept because a lot of you out there are better thinking to yourselves, but doesn't that mean we're overvaluing the asset? And the answer is no, it doesn't. Because you're not looking at entity-specific situations, you're looking at the market value of this. Remember, entity-specific means you're looking at how you, as a company, would apply it. Whereas we're looking at the fair value. What could you sell this for in the market? And that means somebody buying this machine would buy the machine with the capacity of doing 5,000. They don't care whether you're doing two or three or 4,000. So this creates quite a, an interesting scenario where you're now required to say all assets that we're fair valuing, we would assume are being used to their highest and best use. But there are some constraints, and what I mean by that is there are a number of things you have to take into account. The first of those is you obviously have to assume that it's physically possible. So I can't sit and say, well, I'm going to assume this machine can do 10,000 chocolates, because physically it can only do 5,000. Secondly, you have to look at its location and size. Uh, is the market able to take 10,000 chocolates? Maybe I live in a very small town, there's nobody around for 500 miles, and uh, the only thing I could ever do is produce 5,000. Well, you need to take those type of things into account because those are market inputs and not necessarily entity-specific inputs. The second thing you have to look at is you have to look at what's legally permissible. So, for example, I may say to you, well, we have a situation where uh, you can only operate, let's say, in a certain country for eight hours a day. Maybe the reason for that is that the machine produces a lot of uh, CO2 uh, gas into the air and the law says you can only work for eight hours a day because otherwise you're polluting the atmosphere. Therefore, legally, you can only work for eight hours a day. Now, if my machine is capable of operating 24 hours a day, that is irrelevant because what we're saying is we're saying legally I can only work for eight hours a day. And if I can only work for eight hours a day and that applies to everybody, I would have to take that into account. And then the last thing I've mentioned on this slide is financially feasible. In other words, if I was going to take this asset and convert it into something different and use it differently, the standard then says what I would need to do is I'd need to say, well, obviously, would this create a reasonable return on investment? So I can't just say, well, I'd convert it into a different machine if that would not make financial sense. Okay, so that's the concept, guys, of highest and best use. And as I said, it is a very different concept. I don't believe that, that, that we've used it ever before in accounting, and I think it's going to be interesting, especially when some of you are trying to explain to your clients that you're valuing a machine based on what it can do in the market and not necessarily how they're using it. But then, of course, there comes in quite a tricky bit. I want you to think of the following scenario. I have a client in, uh, in a country, and let's assume that client is in, say, the packaging industry. So they produce specialized packaging for uh, cardboard boxes or whatever it may be. They have three different sites. Uh, at site one, they've realized that they actually don't need that site anymore because the, the, the capacity of the other two sites can pick it up. So they decide to close uh, one of the sites. The company's policy is that when they close a site, they take all these very, very expensive machines and they destroy them. Why? 
Well, because if they sold the machine to somebody else, they'd be creating a competitor. Uh, and they've taken a decision not to do that, so they decide that they're going to basically destroy these machines. Do you take that into account when you're doing the fair value? The answer is no, you don't. Why? Once again, this is an entity-specific input. What I mean by that is this relates to this company and their choice. They could sell the machine. And in choosing to sell the machine, they could make money. Therefore, what they need to do is they need to value the machine using that concept of highest and best use to say, if we were had this machine, what is the highest and best use? Well, the highest and best use would be to sell it, not to scrap it. So they would not be able to write it down. So assuming, let, let's take the scenario further. Let's assume they have a December year end. They decide in October that they're going to scrap the machine. So they know that in January, they're going to destroy this machine. At the December year end, they may not be able to impair the machine. Why? Well, remember, impairment requires you to look at the higher of value and use, which for them would be next to zero because they're about to scrap the machine, or fair value, less cost to sell. And clearly in that situation, they would have a high fair value. So even though they know they're going to destroy the machine a month later, they could not impair it because they would not meet the impairment requirements. Now that may seem counterintuitive to some of you, and some of you may be thinking it's going to give the wrong answer, but that is actually, if you think of the logic, that is saying the value of the machine in the market. Remember, going back to that definition, what would it take for me to sell an asset in an orderly transaction in a market? So yeah, this is one of those strange ones and give you a bit of a strange answer. The second measurement consideration area that the standard talks about is respect to liabilities. Now, I'm sure many of you out there are saying that we don't fair value liabilities. In fact, the only people we really see fair valuing liabilities is really the, uh, the, the, the financial institutions. Um, so I'm going to go through this relatively quickly because we have found this got very, very little application outside of, of, of the financial institutions or very, very large um, complex treasuries. What they're saying is with your liabilities, they say you obviously need to fair value them. And they say the fair value for liability should always assume that the amount remaining uh, outstanding at the end is not less than what it would cost to fulfill it. So you can't fair value a liability, let's say, let's say I owe somebody uh, $10 million. I couldn't say, well, the fair value of that would be $9 million, uh, because maybe I get an early settlement discount. If, for example, the, uh, the, the requirements of the agreement say I could never pay anything less than 9.5 then I'd have to fair value it only down to 9.5. So they're saying a liability can never be less than basically the amount that would be outstanding once we had done the, the transfer. Now when you're fair valuing your liabilities, it says ask yourself a number of things. The first thing it says you should ask yourself is, is this liability that I have held by somebody else as an asset? An example of that would be if I've issued bonds into the market, uh, my, the bond for me would be a liability, whereas for you potentially if you purchased my bonds, it would be an asset. And it says if it is an asset, well, it's easier to value an asset than to value a liability. So what they said is value it as if it was an asset in the other person's hands. Um, if it's a quoted uh, price, so if it's a listed uh, bond, for example, well, that's easy. Use the market price for that. If it's not, then they say use some sort of valuation technique to determine the fair value of the asset. Adjust it, if need be, for any factors that would take into account with it being a liability, and use that as the fair value. So they're saying, obviously, where somebody else holds as an asset, Use that as the starting point. They then also talk about for liabilities those not held by others as assets. And they say this is, for example, where you've got things like decommissioning liabilities or rehabilitation provisions or any sort of provision. And they say what you'd then do, obviously, is you'd fair value this based on various factors. Uh, what does the, the cash flows be, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the interesting thing about this uh, slide is that they generally, you look at this, and I'm sure many people are out there saying, but we don't fair value liabilities, uh, generally, the, especially provisions. So if I'm not fair valuing a, a provision, why would they have a slide on this? And then you realize, as I've mentioned at the bottom, that the ISB has got on its agenda, albeit a bit long agenda, to relook at IS 37 on provisions. And I think what you need to realize about that is as the new provision standard comes out, you may end up in a situation where they require more fair value. But that at the moment is speculation. So a key thing to point out is obviously if you do have liabilities which are not held as assets by others, you will need to go and do a fair value exercise. Now, let's just take a second there to, to recap where we are. We started off at the beginning, we've looked at the scope. We can see who this applies to. 
we said when you're determining fair value, you need to establish a hypothetical scenario that looks at what is the orderly transaction, what is the market in which this transaction takes place, and who are my market participants. In determining this hypothetical scenario, it said just remember, especially for assets, that we have the concept of highest and best use. Now once you've done all that, you've now set up the environment in which the fair value may take place. Now what you need to do is you need to do that fair value. Now remember, fair values can arise in one of two ways. Either on initial recognition, in other words, when you recognize a transaction, or more commonly on subsequent recognition. For example, where you're fair valuing investment property or any pp &E on an ongoing basis. Now, the one on initial recognition I always think is a bit easier. Because generally it says that the transaction price is normally going to be equal to fair value on initial recognition. An example of that is you go down to your local supermarket and you decide to buy a Coca-Cola. If you go down to the supermarket and you pay for argument's sake $5 for a Coca-Cola and you walk out, the assumption is going to be that that's fair value. Why? Well, if we look at those factors listed in the, in the slide. Firstly, are you a related party? Well, let's assume you're not. You have no relation to the people who own the, the, the store. Secondly, is it a forced sale? Well, no. You walked into the store and you chose to buy something. Thirdly, is, it a, is there any unit of account? So, for example, is it a business combination or transaction or something that's over and above just the normal purchase? In a mass situation, it wouldn't be. And lastly, is this going to be in the principal market? Uh, and the answer would be yes. That's where the store is. You've walked in, you've bought a Coca-Cola. So the key thing to point out is if you're buying something in the market and it's a general arm's length transaction, our assumption would be that that's fair value. Unless, of course, there's evidence to prove otherwise. And, and the only evidence really, as I say, to prove otherwise are things like business combinations where other factors may be taken into account. So the initial recognition is normally a bit easier. The subsequent uh, measurement is the one that gets a little bit trickier. And this is the one that says, right, when I've, when I've got assets or liabilities on my balance sheet, I need to do fair value continually. So, for example, things like, the, uh, like property planting equipment or investment properties. I need to fair value those on an ongoing basis. Now, what we are going to do is we're not going to talk about how you do the calculations. Um, what, if, you, if you're needing to help with the physical calculation, uh, I assume most of, the, of, of you out there have access to uh, valuation experts. If not, uh, let me know. We can point you in the direction of some. But the key thing to point out is how do we do these valuations? Now, when you took your valuation techniques, there are generally three approaches you can take. The market approach, the income approach, or cost approach. Key thing to point out is that you, you need to obviously look at which of these works best for you. Okay? Um, and, 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 and you're always trying to estimate the price at which the transaction would occur at the date in which this transaction happens. And obviously some of the inputs you put may be observable, for example, market prices, interest rates, forex prices, and there will be unobservable inputs, things that are more specific that, that you wouldn't necessarily find in the market. All of these need to be taken into account in determining a fair value uh, so that you can end up with, with the right fair value. Now, let's take a look at each of those approaches. The first approach I want to take a look at is the, the market approach. And the market approach says to you, this is a, a valuation technique where you use prices that are generated in market transactions. So classic example are, well, are listed shares. If you buy shares in a listed company, you can go and look at the, uh, whatever exchange they're listed on and get a price from that. Uh, in addition to that, there may be a very liquid uh, market in your country for things like secondhand cars or second-hand trucks, or whatever that may be. If there is a liquid market and you can point to a transaction with which to refer to it, you can do that. So the fair value, this is probably the easier one to get a fair value because there's not as much work to be done, but the key thing to point out is you need to have the market with which you can refer to to get that. The second approach is the income approach, and this one says what we're doing is we're taking the future amounts, in other words, all the inflows and the cash and the expenses, etc., and we are discounting it back to an amount. This is very common in the property sector, where we say, if I've got a building, I would look at how long do I think the building will last, how much can I rent it out for, what will it cost me to, to maintain it, uh, what is my occupancy rate, etc. I discount it back, and based on the current market expectations, I would see what I think the value of this building is, based on the discounted cash flows. The last approach it talks about is the cost approach, and, and this one is one that says, what do you do in a situation where your client ha has, a, has a machine or has some asset that really 
you can't get a market price for. And secondly, the income approach won't work because of various reasons. Now, I'll give you an example. I had a client who had a certain printing machine. Uh, it used to do a special type of printing onto boxes and needless to say it was a, 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 some specialized machine. When he first adopted IFRS, we had to fair value the machine. And the challenge he had was he said there's no market for this. It was an old machine, but it still worked, and there was no comparable transactions we could point to. So the market approach would not work. The second one we said was what about an income approach? But the challenge with that was that there were no direct incomes we could really look at because this fed into another process. So it became very difficult to split out the cash flows because it's one of many deliverables. So the one we got to was the cost approach. And we said, what would it cost to reflect this? In other words, what is the current replacement cost of this machine? And what I mean by that is, and I said to him, if the machine was destroyed tomorrow, what would it cost to replace it with another machine that can do the same thing with a similar capacity? Once we'd done that exercise, now we had a fair value. Now, the key thing to point out is I've said to you that there's the market, the income, and the cost approach. No, the standard doesn't say you should use one or should use the other. It says use the one that is most applicable to the asset or liability you're looking at. And obviously, different assets and different liabilities will require different inputs. Uh, if you look at the illustrative guidance in the standard, and I would suggest for those of you who work with this to, to go to IFRS 13 and look in the, in the implementation guidance, but a lot of their examples, the, the, the calculations include two. So sometimes they do the market and the cost replacement, or the income and the cost replacement, and various ones uh, to see which one they think is better. So you may need to do more than just one calculation. So folks, where we are now is we've been through that, and that's the, 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 the sum total of, of the IFRS 13 requirements. If you're sitting there and saying to yourself, this doesn't sound easy, uh, then I think you've understood it well. Uh, this isn't easy. In fact, I think this is probably one of the more complex standards that the ISB has brought out. But I think what you will need to do is you'll need to spend more time taking a look at it. Right, let's move uh, on to the last thing. Uh, the last thing we are going to take a look at is the, um, is the, 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 the area of disclosure. IFRS 13 lastly brings in a whole lot of disclosure and says what you need to do is you need to give certain disclosures in terms of what they call levels 1, 2, and 3. Now many of you will look at this and say this looks very similar to the disclosure in IFRS 7 on financial instruments. Um, if you're thinking it looks uh, the same, you're correct. It's exactly the same. What you need to do is for all the fair values you determined, you need to say, was the fair value determined in terms of level 1, level 2, or level 3? Now, level 1 is where you've determined the fair value based on an active market. So you've gone into the market, you can see the price, and you've used the market to get it. Level 2. These are where you've got inputs other than quoted prices. So you've done a calculation of fair value, but you've used some market and potentially some non-market inputs. So there have been a mix of inputs that have gone in. And level three clearly is where you've done the fair value and it's based purely really on, on non-market data, so inputs that you've done yourselves. Now, why do I ask that? The reason this becomes important is because the standard says they're wanting to know whether something is one level one, level two, or level three. And the reason they say that is because they're saying that it, it gives people a sense of, of, of security. I mean, if I said to you, right, here's my company, and I've got a $100 million worth of fair value in the income statement. Well, if I said to you, of that $100 million in the income statement, um, $95 million of it was level one, which means it was determined in terms of the market, and the other was a five million was level three. You'd probably feel a bit more comfortable because you're saying most of the fair value is market driven. Whereas if I said to you of the hundred million, ninety-five million was level three, now you're probably going to be a little bit more concerned. Why? Because the challenge there is we're saying that ninety-five million of my hundred million movement, I calculated with no market input. I calculated myself. Now, we all know that you can change some discount rates, uh, choose a, change an assumption here, and you could end up with a lot more, uh, a, lot, uh, a very different number. So what this is saying is it's giving people the opportunity to see whether or not they really kind of, not trust, but what, uh, how much of it was market driven and how much of your fair value was not market driven. Key thing to point out, though, is that you always put something in its lowest level. So for example, if you've done a fair value calculation, some markets, some not, it could only ever be level two or level three. You can't say, well, because there is a market input, it must be level one. So very importantly, you do need to put something in its lowest level. Now, what do they want you to disclose? 
You also, in addition to the disclosure I'm about to discuss, remember you do still need to give the disclosures required by the underlying standards. So for example, investment property, IS-40, you would need to still give the disclosures in IS-40. These are in addition to that, uh, now starting to ask for additional information. Let's take a look at them. They want you to first off give the level in the hierarchy for each fair value. So what do I mean by that? I mean, for every group that you're, every class of asset that you've done a fair value for, you need to give the, the, the level. So you may say investment property is level one. Uh, even within property, plant, and equipment, you may have different categories. So you may say my plant and machinery is level two. My computers are level three. My office equipment is level one. And there may be different levels, and you'll obviously need to put those in to help a user understand. The second thing they want is you to do any transfers. So where you've transferred between level one and two, you need to uh, explain why you've done that. And then for all the level three disclosures, they want a reconciliation. And what they want for the level three disclosures, they want you to show all gains and losses that you've recognized in profit and loss in the statement of comprehensive income, all gains and losses that you've put into other comprehensive income in the statement of comprehensive income, any purchases, sales, issues, and settlements of assets or liabilities in level three, and lastly, any transfers into or out of level three and the reason for those transfers. So it is quite onerous when you're taking a look at the disclosure. What I would point out to you is I think this is going to require a lot more disclosure for you, and I think you are going to need to, to do a bit more work on it. So yeah, once again, making the financial statements a lot thicker, additional disclosures you're going to need for assets at fair value. So when does this become part of your lives? Well, folks, this becomes effective 1 January 2013. So this is becoming effective very, very soon. Um, you may early adopt it if you want. Uh, it's up to you, really. One nice thing to point out about this, as opposed to the other standards that we discussed in the last few webinars on, business, uh, on group accounts, is that uh, you only have to do this prospectively. Reason being, the ISB does not like you as a principal to apply retrospective judgment. In other words, we don't want you to go back and say, what would fair value have been in 2011? Uh, because we're already kind of into 2013 when this is applicable, they're not necessarily asking you to do that. So the key thing to point out here is you will not need to do this retrospectively. Lastly, just also point out there's no requirement to provide comparative disclosures. So in year one, when you apply this, you will only have to give that year's disclosure. Only from year two and year three will you have to start giving the comparatives. That, folks, is uh, a, a summary of the IFRS 13 standards. Now, um, there is one thing, last thing to point out that the International Accounting Standards Board has said that there are going to be some uh, some challenges. What they mean by that is that they're believing they're going that, that there have been a lot of questions on it, and what they have said they're going to do is that they are going to um, bring out additional implementation guidance. So we are hoping later in this year we will see additional implementation guidance to help us with this. Um, but I do think that you need to start getting very comfortable with this and uh, and getting yourselves up to speed with how you're going to do it. The one last piece of advice I do give you is what we've been advising all our clients. Maybe what you should do is go and identify where you need to do fair values at each company. Pick one or two assets, go out and actually try and do those fair values. I think if you went and actually tried to do the fair value calculation at the moment, I think you would be able to see where it's going to create problems and where it's not. That, folks, was, uh, was the, uh, the IFRS uh, 13. I am going to, if you've got any questions, you can click the question bar um, that is, uh, is, is on the menu there, and you can uh, obviously uh, type in a question, and I'll be able to answer those if you have got. Um, I'll give you a moment to let any of those come through. In the meantime, as we're doing that, um, just to point out, the next uh, three webinars will be updated on your widget shortly. Uh, we are going to be looking next month at the amendments to ICE 1 and ICE 19. Uh, just to let you know, ICE 1, that is the Statement on Presentation of uh, Financial Statements, they've changed again uh, the way you present your Statement of Comprehensive Income, your old income statement. So changes to, to how you're going to present that. And uh, some small changes to ICE 19 on pensions. So we'll take a look at those. Uh, in the following month, we are going to take a look at the exposure draft on revenue recognition. Some major changes on that, and I think it'll be worth us having a chat through those. And then later, we'll also be looking at the IFRS for small and medium entities. Uh, for those of you in countries where the SMEs applies, I think it will be a good idea for us just to spend some time doing an overview uh, where we then feel we need to do additional uh, work on the SMEs. What we can do is we can arrange some additional sessions on that. Okay. Um,
I'll see if there are any questions. I don't think any questions have come through, which is fine. If you have got any questions, guys, please do feel free to email us on info at wconsulting.co.za. Um, other than that, uh, thank you very much for attending. I do hope you enjoyed the webinar. Um, I hope you're getting value out of these. If you do know uh, members of your staff who have not been able to attend this, it will be updated on your widget within the next month. Uh, this route will be, has been recorded and they can download and listen to it. In addition, the slides you have seen will be available on the widget within the next week so you can go and download them from there. Uh, that's it folks, thank you very much. Um, wherever in the world you are, we hope you have a great day. Thanks and cheers.